Hello and welcome again to the Writer Review. This is Eric Carrot Writer, and this week we're going to be taking a look back at the 1995 family drama movie titled A Little Princess. Now, A Little Princess runs for one hour and 37 minutes long. It is directed by Alfonso Cuaron. The script was done by Richard Lagravines and Elizabeth Chandler. It is based off of the 1939 novel by Frances Hodgson Burnett. It is produced by Mark Johnson. It was composed by Patrick Doyle, the cinematography by Emmanuel Lubezki, and it was edited by Steven Weisberg. And why did I say that the novel was 1939? No, I think it probably dates back maybe to the late 19th century, maybe early 20th century. Anyhow, the stars of the movie are, we got a bit of a cast here. Okay, we got Lizelle Matthews, Eleanor Braun, Liam Cunningham, Vanessa Lee Chester, Taylor Fry, Heather DeLotes, Kelsey Mulrooney, Rusty Schwimmer, Arthur Mallet, Errol Sitahal, Camilla Bell, Rachel Bella, Caitlin Cullum, Lauren Blumenfeld, Darcy Bradford, Alexandra Raybaum, Jonas Curon, Ken Palmer, Vincent Schiavalli, Peggy Miley, Time Winters, Lomax Study, and Allison Moyer. So the dynamics of the term family movie in Hollywood is that most of the time, they're really not designed that way. In fact, a lot of family-themed movies tend to have a great deal of darkness. I mean, yeah, okay, I kind of understand that in order for a movie to work, you have to have some kind of edginess so that you can hold the fan's interest, so you can keep your audience glued to their seat, expecting the unexpected. I mean, not all, I mean, yeah, not all family movies are always light-headed, saturine, and rainbow fruitiness. No. You have to have some kind of level of darkness, some kind of an obstacle, some kind of an antagonistic manifestation in order for a movie to fully envelop. And sure, kids will likely get invested in the movie. The parents, they tend to not really have that much interest. Unless there is some kind of a dark-sided thing or something that can actually have a particular aim that the adults can understand better without being spoon-fed with sugary sweetness that the kids tend to gestate to. Most of the material that comes out of Walt Disney Studios, for example, is entertaining material for the children, but can be at times laboring to the adults, feeling that things that might appeal to kids might probably just dumb down to the parents. And I'm not saying that kids are stupid, but what I'm saying is, is that kids don't look or scrutinize deep into narrative plots. They just want something to keep themselves busy and occupied and not have to worry about the goings on that's happening in their lives Whereas adults tend to like to want to dissect and see if there's any kind of intellectual merit that they themselves can understand. Without just falling into the obvious. Like, yeah, yeah, I know, let's move on. More so with the live action films then compared with the animated stuff, which is quite entertaining in itself. However, 
this 1995 gem, which was, of course, based off of a 19th century novel by Frances Hodgson Burnett, A Little Princess is not a product of Disney, thank goodness, but it was distributed by Warner Brothers, whose target audience might appeal to young girls 10 years and up. But to those who might not fit in that demographic, I don't see why anybody else would not want to be invested in this finely well-crafted, near-perfect movie. I'm not saying it is perfect. There are flaws. There's a few red herrings that I will point out. But still, nonetheless... It might be, its target audience might be young preteen girls because most of the cast consists of young preteen girls. But still, from an adult perspective, there's also something in there for them as well. It's not just tied down to just one particular audience, but more from a universal standpoint. Adapted from the novel Sarah Crew in 1888 by children's author Francis Hudson Burnett. This is the third adaptation of this novel. The original was made in 1917 that starred Mary Pickford, and the second was in 1939, and it starred one of the great legendary childhood actresses in its days. I'm talking, of course, an alcohol, an alcoholic beverage that was named after this actress. I guess you know by now, Shirley Temple. All right, I'm cracking jokes there, but yes. Now, of course, you all know I might be old, but I'm not that old. So I never saw any of the other two adaptations. I never saw Mary Pickford's one. I'm sure she probably did an exceptional job back in the days when film was still relatively in its infancy and nobody talked. And I'm sure Shirley Temple, with her cute little dimples and all, probably made this their this that adaptation into a time honored classic. I'm only just assuming because I never saw the other two. All right, let's move on. So not as wonderful as the other Hodgson adaptation that I reviewed, The Secret Garden. That came out two years prior to A Little Princess. It looked like it felt like the perfect match to get little girls and their parents to rush to the theaters in drums. Knowing that most of the cast of characters in this movie are girls roughly around 10, 11 years old. Of course, it's going to attract other young girls who want to get their parents to take them to see this movie. Sadly, though, it takes a bit of time to develop the characters and the trailers were not making much of an appeal when it was advertised. Therefore, it was questionable at the time if this movie was going to be a success. I mean, the trailers did not make it convincing. And because this movie requires time to get fully invested, and to fully understand the characters and what their situations are. We don't know if it was going to be a box office smash. And although, you know, I was a big fan of The Secret Garden. Which came out in 93. I was a little bit hesitant myself if A Little Princess was going to be a successful follow-up 
prior to the other Francis Hodgson Burnett novel that was adapted. It could have been hit or miss. But from my perspective, I would like to think it was a hit. Maybe it didn't score too well in the box office, but maybe it may have had more or less a cult classic following, which means that it may have not did well in the box office, but once you probably bring it home, watch it at home, or if it appears in syndicated television, maybe it probably gained a new fan base. So, what is the story about? Sarah Crew was wonderfully played wonderfully by relatively newcomer to the movie industry at the time. Her name was Lizelle Matthews. She plays the role of Sarah Crew, a motherless girl who in 1914 leaves her beloved country of India because her father, a war veteran named Captain Ralph Crew, played by Liam Cunningham, has been stationed to enter the war as World War I is underway. She is now taken from India to New York City to reside in an all-girls boarding school who is under the supervision of the wicked headmistress by the name of Miss Minchin, played by Eleanor Braun, who abides by draconian protocols and indoctrinated in proper etiquette. Sarah takes a direct hatred for the place, but once she becomes adjusted, her knack for storytelling and the general comforting nature of her soul gets the girls to respect her. Everybody gravitates to her, especially when it comes to storytelling. And she also has this sort of non-judgmental ways about her. She's the type of person who thinks everyone is beautiful in their own special ways. Some people might have labeled her a tropey girl, you know, meaning the fact that she has this whole belief that you guys all should deserve a trophy for every time you wake up in the morning, although that could be a bit of a stretch in my part. I mean, I'm sure she probably thinks that, you know, kids who have strong work ethics, strong dedications to making the world a better place, and maybe even people who put their who put themselves behind others should deserve happiness. And it's just that whenever she gets into storytelling mode about her adventures and and everybody to her, everybody likes to like come to her because unlike a lot of the other girls in this school she is different while everything in this school seems to have some kind of uh I'm not going to say dystopian but very intolerable measures Mostly because of the headmistress, Miss Minchin. Sarah Crew kind of like brings something new to them. Something more comforting. Something more settling, reassuring, and optimistic. She even, she, she just remains this kindred spirit. And this is coming especially from a 10 year old. You don't find that in a lot of 10 year olds. 
And I'm not saying that all 10-year-olds are immature, cynical, or look at the world in a negative perspective. But Sarah is the bright dimming light in a very dark environment that these kids seem to have. Mostly because Miss Minchin is very authoritarian in her rulings. And she also lives by a rule book that's probably 300 pages long. And maybe as I speak, it may have moved up to 301. Or 302 as I speak. Hey, she just keeps bringing in new stuff, huh? I mean, when she was introduced to her room, you know, it's filled with all kinds of priceless, valuable stuff and things like that. And at first, Miss Minchin kind of gave her a room that kind of seemed to be seemed to suit her more upper class livelihood. And as she was making progression to not only just have a positive effect towards the girls at the boarding school and also taking her time to adjust well as a student and as a boarder. Well, as you would expect, hey, this is a family movie. Family movies does not actually necessarily mean everything is peachy keen and bright sunshine. Well, apparently things take an immediate nosedive as bad news literally falls at her doorstep. That her father is missing in action in the war and may have been presumed dead. There's a key word to that. Is it dead? No. Is it war? No. Is it father? No. It's presumed. Which means he's not officially dead. But we can only just assume that he's dead. They just don't know where his whereabouts. And not only that, the Indian government has decided to confiscate his belongings. Which also included her belongings. And Sarah has now been demoted to being a servant girl. At one time she was a preppy student with all the other preppy rich girls. But since... She, since her father has been presumed dead, dear old Daddams cannot afford for her to remain a student. So Miss Minchin, instead of just, you know, kicking her off, kicking her out of the estate and making her go out in the streets, she decides that if she's going to stay, she's going to have to pull her own weight. Which means that she's going to be demoted from a student to a servant. She's going to go from her beautiful pretty dresses to almost wearing burlap sacks. And kind of like have a Cinderella pre-Prince Charming look to her. Oh, and she's not going to sleep in her nice little warm, comfortable bed with her dolls and her porcelain figurines and her other beautiful prized boat longings. No, no, no. She's going to be wearing rags, burlap, and she's going to be sleeping in a cold, dark attic. Oh. And if the rats bite at her ass, well, nobody else's problem. 
Too bad. Sucks to be you. I'm sorry. I had to do that. Also, her world of imagination is neither tolerated or approved by Miss Minchin's standards. But is that going to hold Sarah down? Not in the light. Not in the slightest. No. Her optimism might soon also take more of a better chance for more of an opportunity for her to be even more creative than she was when she was wearing these fancy immaculate looking dresses. In fact, her poor get-up may be inspiring her to be more creative. Maybe this is just her way of escaping the fact that she lost everything. And now she has to kind of use her imagination to think she's got everything. So the focal direction to a little princess is to send a positive message of keeping a positive message even through your darkest times and that the power of imagination bears no limits. When she was living in India, her father used to remind her that all girls were princesses and she firmly kept that message within her throughout the entirety of the movie is that no matter what obstacle is bringing her down, nothing is going to drain out her spirits. Not even you, Miss Minchin. No one was excluded in the circle of princesses, even those who are manipulative, snobby, or vile. And there are quite a few of them. Especially one of the girls who's a bully and a snob. Which I think her name was Lavinia. I mean, there's like so many female characters and there's so many young girls in this movie. That um, sometimes it was hard to keep up. Some of them had more dimension than others. But I do recall Lavinia being one of the more antagonistic schoolgirls in this movie. Magic also plays an integral part in Sarah's mind. And she is a firm believer in it. And that her father tells her it's real if you fully believe in it. The stories of Prince Rama and Princess Sita seems to have a mesmerizing effect on her peers as everyone gravitates to their adventures better than the mundane stories Miss Minchin has to offer. When Sarah soon starts to have to become subservient towards the school children, they must now have to secretly escape Minchin's clutches to come to Sarah and to be intrigued by her unique blend of storytelling. And even though the cold, dark world of reality that bestows upon Sarah Sarah still finds the beauty of imagination and magic to get her through her days and her impact has an effect on not just the other schoolgirls, but of a black servant girl by the name of Becky, played by Vanessa Ann Chester, who Sarah becomes friends with. Because Sarah is all about inclusivity, regardless and regardless of class, race, religion, creed, 
orientation. Everyone is invited to her world. No one is inferior or insignificant. No matter how cruel the world is, no matter how dark her life has become, she's not just gonna, she's not just gonna, like, let these dirty rags and her unkept appearance gonna bring her down. Or anybody else. Her world of imagination holds a special place for her, even in the confines of a cold, dark attic. And everybody starts to also grow to liking her. Even bullies like Lavinia even starts to show some great levels of sympathy, especially when her father's locket was taken from her by Miss Minchin. They even go to great lengths to try to get it back. Even when it comes to just playing mind games with the other caretakers at this boarding school. Especially when Miss Minchin is not around. But I think it's the ending of the story that really, really will put a tear to your eyes. Yes, I understand that family movies do tend to have a lot of very emotional impact. Especially tear-jerking moments. Especially in the end. Where, I'm, I know I'm giving away spoils, but I'm thinking that people who actually did see this movie may know that her father didn't really die. He just had amnesia. And that he was not living, like, far behind. I think she was, I think he was, like, under the care and was like next door to the boarding school. And yeah, it was kind of sad when he didn't actually remember that he had a daughter. But then when he came to his senses after that head wound and the head trauma, he eventually then started to realize that yes, she is my daughter. And that he's come to get her home. And I think he also legally adopts Becky. So that she can actually ensure to have a better life. And when the news finds out that Miss Minchin was hiding. Captain Crew. From his daughter. Well, eventually, Miss Minchin had no other alternative but was forced to resign from her position and was eventually reduced to just being a chimney sweep, a chimney sweeper, and was being bossed around by a kid who she abused before. Yeah, so she does get her comeuppance. And I believe it was Miss Minchin's sister that eventually becomes the new headmistress. And she'll do everything in her power to make the environment a much more better place. I mean, the final scenes are just enough to bring one to tears. So I hope you do have your tissue boxes at hand because it's going to be very very emotionally draining so you may find the film sweet which it is throughout most of the time 
even through the darkest periods. But I can't say the movie is entirely perfect. I mean, the performances were overall really good. I just couldn't think of really a bad performance too much. But if there was a weakness, well, for one thing, as good of a performer as Eleanor Braun is in her role as the statistic wicked headmistress Miss Minchin, she is a great actress. No, make no mistake about it. I mean, she is convincing in her performance. Very convincing. From her posture, her hair, and the tone of her voice. The thing that she lacks is subtlety. And she does not conceal any way, shape, or form that she is the villain in the story. We know she's the villain of the story. But the problem is, even she knows it too. And that's where it could be a bit of a weakness. That's where we might see a bit of a red herring there. I mean, unlike The Secret Garden, where our main antagonist, named Miss Medlock, played by Maggie Smith, was the villain in the story. She was a she thought that she thought that she wasn't doing anything villainy. She was protecting Colin Craven, who she thought who she generally thought was sick. Because he had a bit of a hunchback. And actually genuinely thought he was frail. To the point where even he convinced himself that he was frail. But in reality. Once it turned out that he wasn't as frail. She probably was trying to protect herself from. Losing her employment. Watching over Colin Craven. So she thought that. By keeping him. In his room. Assuming that he is sick was going to protect her job. But once she found out that Colin was not sick and that he was a healthy young boy, then she knew her wrongdoings and signed in her resignation. Now, Miss Minchin doesn't hide the fact that she's violent statistic, even going so far as to keep Captain Crew. Away from Sarah. Just so that she could have power over Sarah. Overpowering the rest of the other girls at the boarding school. And giving her that power lift. That superiority complexity. Solidified in her brain. She, she doesn't make any kind of denials that she's not exactly a very good person. And that is kind of where the big weakness is. Most villains in the story don't even think that what they're doing is evil. But her, oh, she knows it. And she doesn't really give a damn for any kind of sympathy. The saddest part to Miss Minchin is that she doesn't have any redeeming qualities to even make her feel any signs of sympathy. Maybe the closest we ever get is when Sarah asks her about what her father would say about you. And her cruel treatment towards people who are not of the upper classes or people who or or her or her authoritarian dictatorship at the boarding school. 
I mean, she does hesitate for a bit. But that's the closest we get to see some level that we might find a little microcosm of sympathy towards her. But then it quickly becomes an afterthought when she returns to her nasty ways by making her character even more irreparable and one-dimensional. Even from the moment that we see her, we can tell she's bad news. I mean, she's always wearing dark clothes, which I know is kind of a cliche. But it just sort of is an indicator that when you see somebody who's always constantly wearing dark clothes and always seems to be talking in some kind of one-dimensional cold gestation, Well then, there's no concealment. We knew she was a villain from the beginning, and she just remained that way since then. It just makes everything all predictable. And we knew that somewhere down the line, she was going to get her comeuppance. It's just a matter of when and how. But it was gonna but it was coming just a mile away. Other than that, the movie is met with few flaws, as there's something in there for everyone to enjoy. So I'm not actually dissing Eleanor Braun. It's not her performance that was bad. It was just the way that her character was that ran through the narrative that was bad. She's a great actress. She's got talent. She's been around for a long time, way before I was born. Hell, she played the villain character in the 1965 Beatles movie, Help. So she's been in the craft for many, many years. I don't know if she still is today. I mean, I know she's in advanced age. She's in her mid to late 80s. And if she's still going on, the more power to her. She's a great actress. It's just, she just did not have a good character. I'm sorry to say. She was the weak point in this movie. So, if I was to give this movie a scale out of 10, I will give A Little Princess from 1995 a 9 out of 10. So, I would highly recommend you see this movie. It's innocent. There is some dark territories. There is some tear-jerking moments. But it is very well crafted. It's very well timed. And it's something for everyone to see. It's not just some one dimensional. Costume drama period piece. There's a lot of good things going for this movie. And. I hope you guys come and see this one. So I guess that's the end of my writer review. Thank you all for listening in. If you wish to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please feel free to do so. If you wish to leave a comment. Go right ahead, but just remember the three simple rules. Be kind, be courteous, and please refrain from any rude comments. And I'll be back again with another movie review. So until next time, this is Eric Correct Writer saying, keep watching those movies, and I'll see you around. Goodbye.